Hi, I'm here today with Peter Gago, Penfolds winemaker, and we have just spent the last four hours tasting through the Penfolds Collection 2022, and it was a thrilling, thrilling collection, Peter. Thank you. Thank um, you. Certainly was thought provoking and teeth staining. And teeth staining, yeah, we've had lots <laughs> yeah. of red wine. Sorry about the teeth. Um, the thing I think it's really important to understand about the Penfolds collection when it's released is that they release over a number of different vintages. So the matrix of vintages on show each year changes. Um, but this year, we had the benefit of looking at the 2021 white, and 21 was a gorgeous, cool, even long season in, in South Australia and, and produced wines of grace and elegance and poise. Um, and Tasmania, where we'll, we'll look here as well. Um, and then Top End Grange 2018. I mean, what a gorgeous... Way to end. Gorgeous way to end. <laughs> so yeah. um, I really want to dive into this first wine. This is a 2021 Yatana. Tell us a little bit about Tasmania. Yes, well, Tasmania's come into, gee, quite a, a pivotal role. Uh, a few years ago, people were thinking that Yatana's become a Tasmanian Chardonnay, and it hasn't, but in some years it will shine. You know, in a year like this, there's a, quite a pronounced amount from that island state. But we love what we see down there, but not to forget the Adelaide Hills, Southern Victorian Tumbarumba as well. So we're not setting a template that must come from anywhere. It's just the best of what we can get in a given year. And that's really the story of Yatana. We often joke it's not what you put into the blend, it's what you take out. And some regions will work better than others. And Kim Schroeder, our white winemaker, has a very definitive idea of what he wants. We come in a bit later and we've got every idea under the sun, but um, it's a style that has evolved quite substantially over the years. There's very little anything other than Tasmania and Adelaide Hills in this wine, is that That's correct? That's right, just those two regions yes. for that current release. Yeah, it can be up to four states. You know, yeah. people are fainted by this stage usually. Like four vineyards? No, no. Four viticultural regions? No. Four states? Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, nothing ever crushed. It's pressed in situ, chilled, and then barrel fermented back in the Barossa Valley. Okay. Yeah. Um, the thing that I was really, really astounded by with this wine today is that it came in at 12.5%, which I suppose is very little surprise given mm. the cool season that birthed yeah. it. Um, but it has just coiled latent power. I mean, this is a very powerful, very restrained wine um, and incredibly impressive for that. Mm. And I think it's a really good springboard into this next wine <laughs> because you've probably never seen anything like this. I certainly haven't. And is this the fine? This is not the final label. Uh, not the final label. That's, a, in effect, a lab label, but the wine was bottled. It's the real wine. It was bottled about two and a half, three months ago. Okay. So we're, we're tasting the real thing here, if I can use that expression. You can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this is five, as the label suggests, and it is 20% each of five different vintages. Indeed, yes. Going back to 2011, the 11, the 12, 14, 16, and the yet did be released, 2021. It's yeah. wild. Okay, we, <laughs> we know the G3, G4, G5 template, and it was, it's really tempting to compare this wine to that. That's certainly what I did initially when Peter was explaining um, the concept to me. But it's very different to the G3, oh, very G4, much so. 5 wines. The reds were put together as a blend and then matured in barrel thereafter. So even in like in G4, which went all the way back to 2002, 4, 8, and at that stage the 16 uh, matured as a blend. This one hugely risky you know like oxidation picking up color or whatever but you can see the color of it there's not much difference between that color if any and the the last yatana the current release yeah. which will come out in august um, so hugely risky and why five will you know you go beyond five and you start ending up we used the term earlier the solera uh, here we can see characters of the 11 characters of other vintages but it's filling the mid palate. It's almost not offering an immediacy, but we joked in the other room, you know, what do we want with Chardonnay as it grows older? We just hope that it hangs in there. This is doing a lot more than that. So it's taking a lot of the guesswork out of it. And I don't think it's been done before with Chardonnay anywhere. This Certainly is Certainly not with still wine. No, I mean, no, no. We're used to this concept, of course, in champagne. Champagne. Mm -hmm. um, with with um, reserve wines. Um, but I've never had it with a still table wine before. And a white table wine. And I think the thing to really remember is that it is punctuated by the acidity and the poise and the line of the 2021 Yatana. That is the first impact, the acid and the life in the mouth. But it has a thundering baritone of rich fruit and power mm -hmm. and it lingers in your mouth um, an extraordinarily long time. I mean, this, this 
blew my socks off, actually. <laughs> and when you told me what it was, I was like, oh, no, this is um, so am I, stressful. Am I allowed to like this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is this really, yeah, yeah, you know, like it is a little bit confronting in terms oh, of, well, the concept. Though. But the proof's in the pudding, you know, and once something's in bottle, and this has been bottled, it is what it is, you know, and this will follow us for a long, long time. It become a bit of a, a bottled time capsule. It'll become lots of things. But there aren't too many bottles of it made for obvious reasons. How many? Can you uh, say? About 2,200 or thereabouts. And it will find good homes. It will be poured. We've just come back from a trip around Europe and into the United Kingdom that we've only poured the odd bottle and the reaction has been amazing. So it's not about gimmickry. It's not about what do we do next. It's about a pursuit of something. Well, what happens as Chardonnay ages? How can we sort of have a little bit more input to the way Yatana looks? Because this is essence of Yatana. It's 110% Yatana. Well, 100%. And um, yeah, it is what it is. And we're just so pleased with the way it's come out. I'm so pleased with the way it's come out. I think yeah, it's just yeah, exceptional. Yeah. yeah. Um, so moving into your next pursuit, which <laughs> is another thrilling um, project, talk to us about this. This is this is Bordeaux. Yes, yes, Bordeaux with a little bit of material, 29% in fact, of Shiraz from South Australia. So it truly is a wine of the world. Uh, we're looking at 59% Cabernet, 29% Shiraz and a balanced 12% Merlot. So quite confrontational. The, the gentleman who we worked with, uh, Frederick, the winemaker for Dort, he was a little bit trepidant. Uh, we had, of course, worked on uh, something similar to it with the Californian Quantum and 149 projects. So to physically send wine across in pallet tanker to Australia, because it was illegal to bottle it in France. We had Why to bottle that? it. Just laws, regulations, yeah. you know, it must be from the region or whatever. Lots and lots of laws and regulations. And again, people we've shown it to as well. You know, it, it isn't sort of Bordeaux. It isn't Australian. What is it? Well, it's, it's a Penfold. wine of the world. It's, it's Penfolds. Penfolds. It yeah. actually smells exactly like a Penfolds wine. It's this American, American oak in there, surely. Uh, yeah, and a little bit of French. Yeah. yeah, 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 a bit of both. Yeah, so yeah. it has that on the nose. You can see that. And actually, the um, the South Australian component really stands up. It's actually in the mouth that it yeah, becomes apparent yeah, that yeah. this is not an Australian And only at wine. 29%. We could have tweaked it more and put more in, but we didn't want it to sort of just shout Shiraz. We wanted it to be this lovely Cabernet Shiraz blend oh, with a bit of Merlot. So the name of it, though, too, is interesting. Um, you know, two hemispheres, two cultures, two different winemaking ethoses, if that's the plural. Um, yeah, very, very different. And I can say already that's the 19, the 20 is different again. We're still working with Dort on the 20 project, looking ahead, who's to know what, never say never. Um, but a very exciting project. We do have a French winemaking trial as well, which is purely Bordeaux, no mix with anything else. But, um, yeah, watch this space. Very exciting days. We were talking about which wine to include, the Dort or the um, the French winemaking trial. And for me, in terms of um, which did I prefer, I slightly preferred the French winemaking trial because I like... Classicism. Yeah. I do. And yeah. I, 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 that's my um, that's what I like. It's your comfort zone. It's very, um, yeah, it is my comfort zone. You're quite right. <laughs> yeah. um, but to me, it, it had a real... Um, we, we find it in Australia very difficult, you know, in the, in the terroir and the fruits that we grow um, to achieve both sweet and savoury. And the best wines achieve both sweet and savoury. And I mean within the bandwidth of ripe picking. Mm -hmm. You can always achieve savoury if you wait a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, but the trick is to get it while it's perfect. And that can be very difficult. And that's why the great vineyards are the great vineyards. Um, and so for me, the Bordeaux wine really carried that um, sweet, savoury complexity. And that's yeah. what made it pleasurable in the yes. mouth. Um, yes. But it does have a a Penfolds wrapping. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, the techniques, you know, we say, yes, the vineyards are obviously in Bordeaux. They are where they are. But the techniques that we use, the lens that we use, the Penfold sort of winemaking processes are quite unique and different. So we don't go into markets like this and sort of say, or vineyard regions like this rather, and say, we'll show you how to make red wine. No, this is what we're doing in a Penfold sense. And working with Dort and with Frederick and the team there, they have their ideas, we have ours for that collaborative one. The French winemaking trial, though, is purely fruit from around the chateau and made in a Penfold way using purely the raw material offered. So made two in different, France. Made in France, bottled in France for the French winemaking trial. Yeah, we don't want to air freight too much wine. 
I'm happy about that from an yeah, environmental yeah. Absolutely. standpoint. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I look forward to seeing these wines in the future when we've got a few vintages behind yeah, us and we can yeah. understand the shape and this the This is a starting point. Direction. And yes. even the name of the French winemaking trial, we're pretty confident with where we're going, but at this point we're still calling it a trial. Great. Yeah. Well, I mean, RWT never grew out of that, and we no, love RWT. No, yeah, so. yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> um, moving into the final two wines, so the Grange, um, I suppose, is self-explanatory, but the McGill Estate was one of my favourite reds from this release, and I think um, for me, and I've written this in the Tasty Note, which I'll release on, on Robert Parker Wine Advocate soon, but for me, um, I always get lavender and Earl Grey tea when I smell mm. McGill Estate. It's yeah. very, very elegant, and I forget every year that I had smelt it the year prior and every year I smell the wine and go, God, it's lavender again. It's gorgeous. Mm. Such an elegant wine. And, you know, 2020 was the second in a string of warm, dry vintages um, in South Australia. And the yields were... Quite low. Quite very, low. Yeah, yeah, very, very yeah, down. Yeah. Um, and But what I have seen of the 20s... I love them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just yeah, think they're they gorgeous. Yeah, albeit lower in volume, but what we've done, we've stuck to style, stuck to the templates, and not messed around with anything, but being very rigorous in what we relegate and what we don't use. And that's part of it. You know, yes, prop up volume, quality might drop, stretch the blend. No, we don't go there. But what we have with McGill is what you see is what you get. It's a 5.2 hectare vineyard, 12 and a half acres. The open fermenters, purely only open fermented purely basket pressed travels eight to ten meters in the hmm. barrel where it completes its ferment so you know we've been making wine in that cellar since the mid 1800s and basically nothing much has changed with the way we make that style of shiraz it's almost the antithesis of the multi-regional grange blend uh, this is handcrafted i think on the palate the texture the mouthfeel you know, it, it sounds a little bit out there when it's, oh, handcrafted and all the rest, but there is something about this that is different to many of the other blends. Single vineyard, single site, expressive wine. It has its own personality, as does this for different reasons, but I just love it. I just find it really beguiling and beautiful, and it's got really great firm tannins. It's, it's a very shapely wine. Oh, absolutely. Plenty of structure, yeah. but it's just... It's mellifluous and yeah. ethereal and gorgeous, and I love it. Yeah. I just think it's a beautiful a wine. A wine of character, quite mm. unique. It is what it is, not pretending to be anything else. That's McGill Estate yeah. Shiraz. Awesome. A monopole. A mono yes. Can I use that term? <laughs> yeah. A tenfold monopole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Grange. So, oh. um, so I think the thing about Grange um, is that very early on on release, these wines are so tannin. There's so much tannin in these wines that it can be impenetrable and difficult to unpick. But I actually think um, on release, the tannins are sort of irrelevant and you should do your best to look past them because the important part about Grange is how it ages. And you should always be thinking about that. You don't drink them within 10 years and then they last for 40 beyond. You know, It's wild to imagine. And so looking at them now as a four-year-old wine is really at this inchoate infant stage for yes. these wines yes. but you get a sense of the personality that they're going to express later and for me this is an incredible incredible iteration of an already great wine it's supple it's day red one. fruits yeah day one it ticks just about every box you know it's not overwhelmingly anything there are no rough edges as we say this is something well, you know, if we use terms like seductive, alluring, poise, polish, gloss, it's in that bottle. And there was something about the 18 vintage, you know, you don't see it too often. Uh, maybe 18 in some parts, 10, 2010, 1990. Now, you know, there's three vintages across the last three decades. Um, it's not trying to sort of show any particular character it's just one big unit this thing called Granger and I use the term big it's not big it's not bold beautiful balance it's balanced that's it's so the, balanced that's the b word to use there I think and it does beckon you I, I, in the other room I was talking about the 2004 Granger very very dangerous beautiful Grange <laughs> you know it leads you into temptation the 04 Grange it does. and I think this one's trying very hard to do that too very alluring there's a seamlessness to the tannins already here. There's nothing out of place. It's streamlined and sleek 
it's polished. Um, I just think it's an, a really, a really incredibly beautiful wine. Um, and I look forward to looking at that in like 2028 because that's yeah. really when we should start yeah, looking at absolutely, it. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Like, you know, there will be people who drink it upon release and it is imminently drinkable now, but the pleasure, the secondary, the tertiary notes that will follow. <clears throat> Let's not forget, you know, Rewards of Patience edition eight, the 52 finally overtaking my favorite, the 53. And both of them will still command perfect scores not from a curio or rarity perspective, the wine in the glass. And then people later, oh, what vintage is that? And you say, almost 70 years old. Yeah. Bottled back in those days when you literally had a hammer and you knocked in the cork, you know, that sophisticated. So goodness knows how long this one will go for. But we'll hopefully be around to watch part of the journey, <laughs> in my it. instance, or the journey in <laughs> yours, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think finally something I'd like to touch on here because we, we understand it's a multi-regional blend from South Australia. So this, um, give me the percentages again. It's 3% uh, Cabernet in that, 97% Shiraz, but as is always the case, 100% new oak. And we commented in there too, like oak, what oak? Mm, it's, Every barrel's new. It's, it's spicy, but it's not um, It's yeah. not overt. And so this is 69% Barossa. Barossa, the balance out of McLaren, Val and Clare. Yeah. And I think um, structurally you can really see each of those regions coming through in the glass because the Barossa for me brings like the red dirt and the blood and the rust and the kind of mm. earthiness and, and McLaren Vale brings the kind of dark brooding fruits and the the side of meat, I think, the yeah, little meat yeah, yeah, in yeah, Clare yes. Val, the best yeah. vineyards. Um, and then Clare Valley, of course, is the polish and the velvet and the opulence. Mm, and so mm. I think those three areas combined bring together under the umbrella of this beautiful year. Yep, it's um, worked beautifully. No McGill in that. Quite often you'll get a little bit of McGill estate, albeit 2-3%, but of not in 2018. <laughs> Didn't quite make it in 2018. It's been a very impressive and very enjoyable tasting, Peter. Well, not a short one. Four not hours. a short one. We tried to just do it in two, but um, yeah, there was a lot yeah. of talk. It was good fun. Yeah, we'll it have was. to do it again. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.